Bamboo's Marketing presents Elder Law Growth, the podcast that helps elder law and estate planning attorneys attract clients without wasting time or money. I'm your host, Amy Hurst. Let's dive in. So I had uh, last week here in Michigan, I I did a workshop and I had at the end of the workshop, I had an 88 year old woman come up to me and she said, I go to workshops, these workshops all the time. She goes, and I never understand what they're saying. And she goes, I love that you tell stories that are like real life stories and that I can relate to them because now I finally understand what this is all about. And she immediately signed up for what we call a vision meeting. That was Jack Myers, an estate planning attorney who has found the key to success in his own law firm. And that key is through workshops. So the thing is, is that anybody can give a speech. Anybody can give a presentation, stand behind a podium and speak for an hour, but it's truly the best who know how to reach their audience and to move them into the next step. Jack is one of those speakers. And that's why I asked him to come onto this podcast today to, to share what his best tips are and what has worked for him. And he's not holding anything back. So if you are thinking about doing workshops or if your workshops are tanking, this episode is for you. He is he is sharing what he uses in all of his workshops. And these things work. He's going to talk about how he opens his workshops, how he's able to avoid the distractions of questions, you know, when people side rail your speech. He's going to share how he gets around that. And he'll talk about how he closes each workshop. And there's, there's a common denominator among everything that works for him. Grab a pen, grab a paper, and get ready to have a much better workshop. Let's dive in. COVID set us back, right? COVID right. hit. Everyone thought workshops were like done. And a lot of law firms were wondering, well, maybe we're stuck with virtual webinars for a long time, but thankfully that didn't happen. Thankfully things snapped back. Things are normal. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness things are normal. And one of the reasons why I wanted you to be on the show, Jack, is because you are the workshops guy. And you were telling me a story about an 88 year old woman. And I want to hear this story again, because it's so good. She told you something spectacular. Right. So, you know, one of the things that we've kind of learned over time and I learned really early on and maybe the hard way is um, when you're doing a workshop, you know, you're trying to accomplish, you know, the no like trust sort of thing. So you got to be relatable. And, uh, and if you're too legalistic, you lose people, they get bored to death um, and they just don't understand. And, and, you know, we always say a confused mind says no. And, uh so I had uh, last week uh, here in Michigan, I, I did a workshop and I had at the end of the workshop, I had an 88 year old woman come up to me and she said, I go to workshops, these workshops all the time. She goes, and I never understand what they're saying. And she goes, I love that you tell stories that are like real life stories and that I can relate to them because now I finally understand what this is all about. And she immediately signed up for what we call a vision meeting. So, yeah, so I mean, just hearing that is great. I mean, we've done, we've had uh, our client services people do workshops before because we didn't want to be lawyers talking to people because, you know, our kind of one of our core values is that we sit across the table from people. We're just people, you know, and um, if we could relate to people that way, we're most successful, we're most comfortable working with people that way. So when we get that kind of feedback from people about our workshops, you know, that's just amazing because, it's, you know, I, I will say this. I just had a client in here and was speaking to her. She's still so confused and I keep trying um, that, you know, it can be really confusing um, material. Um, and if we can simplify it and, and, and present it in a way that's relatable, not only are they more comfortable with the process, but they tend to like us and trust us. I know what, what you said earlier about how a confused mind says no, yeah. just right there, right there. Like that should be, that should be in the background for every speaker to see is a confused mind says no. And yeah. something else, something else you touched on, which I'm curious about, you said your client services. 
So there are they, do they help with your presentations? So I have, so, so this is kind of interesting. So it's more folksy and people will relate when it's not a lawyer talking down to people. Um, so we had a client services coordinator who was very gregarious and uh, super enthusiastic about what we do. And she had attended so many workshops that I put on that she kind of knew the thing from, you know, from A to Z. Um, so she presented a few times, did the workshops herself. Um, and then, in fact, when COVID hit and we started doing virtuals, um, she, we, we were using hers for the estate planning workshop. I, I did the elder law piece, but but that, that was very well received. Um, really? Even though she's not an attorney? Yeah. yeah. So and the other, some of the other firms that have done that have had great success with that and, and actually better kind of conversion rates. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it works and it's worked for other firms. So I think that's something, you know, that's, that's worth exploring. I had a law professor tell me when I was in law school, I went to law school after a first career. So I went kind of late to law school, but I had a law professor tell me, you know, talk to everybody like they're in sixth grade. And, uh, so sometimes for some attorneys, it's just really difficult to do that. You know, what's, what's interesting about what you said about the sixth grade, like talk to them as if they're in the sixth grade. The sixth grade reading level is the average in America. Obviously, right. that's that's what the average Joe can understand. That's that's uh, let's see. Stephen King writes at a sixth grade reading level. Okay. Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, that's why all of these this all of the top novels are written in the sixth grade reading level because they're so easy for anyone to understand and. A very famous politician had his speeches written specifically at a sixth grade reading level, and that's how he got so popular. So yeah. I will avoid politics, so I'm not going to say it, but right. it's just fascinating that even the the writer for um, someone high up in politics, they knew sixth grade reading level. And that's what we were trying to tell our clients also is I know it, 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 as you said, it sounds kind of harsh saying dumbing it down, mm -hmm. but you're just speaking in their terms. Right. Right. And, and if you speak in your own terms, that really makes them feel dumb anyway. So right. yeah, I, yeah. It's, yeah, it's just condescending and yeah, it turns them on. I but, love that. And I love that you use the Brady Bunch. So do you have like a favorite story that really resonates with like the one story that resonates with all of the crowds or do you just mix it up depending on who shows up? So I think so, but I mean, I have several stories that I tell, you know, I, so, you know, we, you know, the Brady Bunch story is probably the one that I tell at every workshop. And then the other one that I tell a lot is we use a thing called dollar stories. So, yeah. So, um, the dollar story we tell it goes like this. So I have two dollars. I, I have them in my hand, and I just said, you know, that can represent any amount of money. Okay. If Becky and I have them and own them in our name, just individual, you know, our, our joint names, what can we do with it? We can spend it, we can save it, or we can give it away. Right? We can do anything we want with it, but it's not protected from our predators and predators because we can do that. So they can come attach it in, in a lawsuit or um, for long-term care purposes. So. Um, so Becky and I go see an estate planning attorney and we create a revocable, li joint revocable living trust. And we put our $2 in the trust, but because it's a revocable trust and we're the trustees, we can spend it, save it or give it away. So our creditors and predators can still attach those assets. We have no asset protection, but we spend some time and we're like, well, we want to make sure that some of those assets are protected for the kids. If one of us were to pass. So the way we structure the trust is if Jack dies, half the money goes into a family trust, which is irrevocable and can provide asset protection. And half just stays out of the trust and Becky can do, live her life and do whatever she wants with it, right? So well, and we kind of have, have different scenarios that we look at. So the first one would be this. So Becky... Paul, so so the, the key, kind of the lynch on this is that in that irrevocable trust, Becky can use those assets. So they can be for her benefit if she needs them, but she has to get permission from a co-trustee to access those assets. So we usually ask the crowd, it's like, so 
what's wrong with that picture? And they say, who's the, hopefully somebody in the crowd says, who's the co-trustee? So in this situation, we would appoint Willa as her co-trustee, my oldest daughter. So Willa is acting as Becky's co-trustee. The money can't come out of the trust unless Willa agrees with Becky that it should. Um, they have the requisite adverse interest because Willa's interest is, is that none of that money gets spent before Becky dies so that she can inherit it. And Becky has an interest in spending it all so that Willa doesn't inherit it, even though they're mom and daughter. But that's an, enough of a legal relation, you know, adverse legal relationship to create the asset protection. In that. So Becky calls Willa one day and says, hey, Willa, I'd like to get $35,000 out of that trust. And Willa says, mom, what do you need it for? And she says, I think it's time I got a new car. And Willa says, mom, that 75 Dodge Dart, yeah. With the rust holes in the side and the back muffler, because we think that's just fine for you. The, the rust holes are just as good as an air conditioning, and you can hear that bad boy purring as it goes down the road but it's from the sound of that muffler. So, Becky's a little frustrated. So, what does she say to Willa? Donald Trump used to say it on TV all the time. We're fired. So, she fires Willa as her co-trustee, but she still can't get her car because she needs a co-trustee to approve it. So, and the trust allows her to fire the coach. So that night she calls Presley and she's all upset. And Presley says, Mom, what's going on? And she goes, Well, I had to fire Willa as my co trustee today. And Willa says, or, and, and Presley says, Mom, why'd you have to do that? She says, Well, I told her I thought it was time that I got a new car. And Presley says, Mom, you deserve a Cadillac. Oh, of course. <laughs> what does Becky say to Presley? You're hired. So of course. Well, she still gets her car. So, I mean, there's some flexibility built in there. So we're not shutting it down so she can't access the assets, though, right? So let's rewind and we'll put Willa back as Becky's co-trustee. So Becky decides one day it's a good day to have a stroke. So she goes to the hospital. They discharge her to rehab and they say, you're never coming home. You're going to have to stay in the nursing home. And here it costs about eleven dollars to $12,000 a month to stay in a nursing home. So the nursing home says, well, Becky... And how are you going to pay for this? And we understand that you have money in a trust. We'd like to take that money. And Becky says, yeah, I guess there's no protections there. You can access that money. So, but we understand you also have some money in another trust that you're the beneficiary of. And we'd like you to get, we'd like to get at that money too to pay for your care. And Becky says, well, my husband and I, we created this trust. We kind of created some crazy rules in this trust. And one of them is that I need permission from my co-trustee in order for the money to come out of that trust. But my daughter, Will, is my co-trustee. She's a good kid. I'm sure she'll do whatever you say. So they call up Willa, and Willa says, well, what's this money for? And they say, that's to pay for the nursing home. And Willa says, what if I tell you you can't have it? They say, well, when your mom runs out of her other money, Medicaid will pay the bill. And Willa says, well, then you can't have it because they can't attach it. It's protected. So we can protect that money for the kids that way. So that's in that situation. So let's rewind another time so becky has always wanted a swimming pool right i live in michigan we have like two months that you can i was gonna it. say it snows I, so much in michigan stupidest idea ever right so <laughs> i want Becky to get a swimming pool because i know who's going to take care of the pool right you say, well, just like the dogs right who ends up taking care of them I end up that you know it's this guy, right? <laughs> so, who's got two thumbs yep you <laughs> uh, so, so I'm dead now, right? And Becky's sitting at the house. She's got a pile of money, right? And uh, um, she decides that uh, it's time to get a swimming pool, right? So this is this is another story I tell kind of in the midst of this. So I tell before, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, so she eventually gets to the pool, and the guy that comes over to service, she she does get sick of cleaning it. The guy that comes over, she hires, hires a pool service to clean it. And Biff, the pool boy, shows up. And Biff's wearing a Speedo. You know, it's really good to Speedo. And he and Becky get it on. So this is another set of stories I tell. So this is a pretty oh, yeah. We come back to Biff. So, so Becky calls up Willa and says, hey, wh hey, Willa, I need $10,000 out of Dad's trust. And she says, what for, Mom? And she says, well, remember Biff, the pool boy? I told you about him, how good he looks in a Speedo. He told me if I take him to the Bahamas for the weekend... Yeah, he wears Speedo the end of it. I go to the Bahamas. Well, this is Bob. You have money in your trust that you can spend on you. The money in this trust is for you if you need it. And for us kids, if, 
it's there's something left when you're gone, right? That's what dad is doing. For sure, he wouldn't really dig the idea of you going with Bill, right? So use your own money to do that. So what does Becky say to Willa? You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> well, I'm not so fast because if you read the terms of that trust, it says if you get remarried, you can no longer fire me as trust your co trustee. And Becky says, I'm not stupid. I'm not getting remarried. We're just going for a long weekend. And Becky says, read, or Willis says, Mom, you need to read the language a little closer in that trust because it says the definition of remarriage is legal remarriage right, or cohabitation amorously for a person for more than one night. So you can't fire these trust. Use your own money to go So you can protect them. You know, really, what we're trying to protect against there is. Older, vulnerable people who've lost a spouse where we've got predators from the outside world coming in and trying to get into their life and mess with their estate plan. So, so we can put those kind of protections in there. So we'll re 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 rewind one more time. Becky's driving down the road one night. It's a rainy night, and she hits a guy riding his bicycle. He's a 28-year-old resident, going to be a brain surgeon, maims him for life. Do you think the insurance coverage is going to, the umbrella insurance is going to cover that lawsuit? Absolutely not, right? Can they get at the open box, the assets in Becky's trust? Absolutely. Can they get at the assets in the asset protection trust? No, they can't. And they, so, so, so that's another way we protect. So that's how you can protect kind of at the death of the first spouse. So that you protect assets for the kids and kind of solves the Brady Bunch problem in that, that scenario. Um, so let's say Becky passes. So now we take the money and we split it into two trusts, one for Presley and one for Willa, and they're each other's co-trustee. Okay. So Presley calls up Willa about three years later and she says, Hey, Willa, I need $250,000 out of my trust. And Willa says, What for? She says, My husband and I want to buy a condo in Florida. And Willa says, Presley, before you fire me, let's talk about this. Why don't we have the trust buy the condo? You can live in it. The trust says you have exclusive rights to beneficial use of any real property owned by the trust. The trust can pay all the expenses associated with the condo, but it's protected in case something happens in your marriage or you need long-term care. And the trustee says, you know, that's not a bad idea. Let's do that. So they move to Florida. And the trustee takes up gardening and her husband takes up golf. And golf, his favorite hole is the 19th hole. But every day he comes home from the golf course, he seems a little bit happier. So one day, Presley finally asks him, she says, honey, what's going on here? This golf thing's been great for you. And he goes, well, it's not so much the golf. It's more the 19th hole. And I've been meaning to talk about you, to you about this for a while. Because it turns out there's a barmaid named Bambi, really young, attractive female. Because I finally got enough drinks in me one day to get up the courage to go talk to her. Turns out we have a ton in common. We got matching tattoos. We got matching Harleys. Here's the divorce papers. Give me half of everything. Does he get the condo? Can't touch it. Your personal is gone. So that's how we can provide protections after you're gone. So those that's kind of the story we tell about the power of asset protection in the trust. So that's beautiful. Those are really <laughs> those are really I know those were hypothetical stories, but I got sucked into them. I was like, no, what's gonna happen? Tattoo? A girl named Bambi? <laughs> <laughs> We got to offset Bill with Bambi a little bit. Oh so, my gosh. So so we try to have fun. You know, we always tell people when they come to the workshop that we make three promises to them. They're going to learn a lot. They're going to have some fun, even though it's kind of morbid material. And the time's going to go by really fast. Can you give numbers or how much of an impact workshops have been for you to help encourage the other listeners that workshops are back, workshops are thriving, and such an excellent way to grow your practice? We live in, I live in a community, 500,000 people in the, I don't know if you call it metropolitan, but in the greater Lansing area, half a million people. Um, we're getting 45 to 50 RSVPs per workshop. But we, this last time we went to two things, okay? It made a huge difference. So we did targeted marketing. So I handpicked 12 zip codes here in our area. And that's who we BAMB is marketed to, okay? We had 45 people sign up, 25 showed up. So of those 25 that showed up, we also offered that $250 coupon for trust-based planning. If you sign up for a vision meeting today, attend it, and then engage for trust-based planning within 30 days, 
we out of those 25 people before they left, we had 15 meetings scheduled. We have callbacks on file. So we're potentially 80% meetings. Whoa, that's yeah. huge. Amazing. Yeah. So so just and I think those are kind of sustainable numbers if we keep doing this the right way. You know, so we're super excited. But now it's kind of up to us. I mean, and I say, you know, the conversion to clients, then it's up to me to sell it or one of our other attorneys, right? So, um, so you know, the job to me of the workshop is to create a relationship. So these people come in, they know us, they know what they're in for. We give them expectations. They're they're educated, so they don't have to start from scratch with them. And we can sit across the table and talk. And, and, and so kind of that combination of how we present the workshop, how we market it, and I think we can get better at that. But we're pretty consistently, once we get them in this room, we're, we're turning six, six out of 60% of those people into clients, 60 to 70% of those people into clients. Basically, your goal is to build out the relationship. So that way, as you said, when they're sitting across from you, it's already warm. It's already a warm lead. Mm -hmm. There's already a good relationship going. Right, right. And we know they're interested in estate planning or they wouldn't come to the workshop in the first place. I want to I wanna dive a little bit deeper into that. How you said it's basically up to you mm -hmm. to convert the people who are in front of you to get them to sitting across from you right there in your office. Right, right. So like off the top of your head, you're thinking, are we talking about like your stories, like trying to be more relatable? Like what are the other uh, tips and tricks that you okay. have up your sleeve? So here's kind of the, so, so as I, as I said, we tell stories in the workshops. Okay. So short of, if we shorten the workshop to an hour and a half and it will soon be an hour and 15, but we're, I don't take the stories out. I just reorganize it a little bit differently because the stories are the linchpin, right? Because what we want to try to do is our process basically comes when they come back in, it's like, we'll talk about incapacity planning. And then we just say, they'll look at the, I say, okay, we're going to talk about above ground. We call it above ground planning because you're above ground, right? And what happens if you become incapacitated? What are we going to do? And then they look at me like a deer in the headlights, right? And I'm like, remember this story? And they're like, oh, yeah. And then it's like, okay. Everyone remembers stories. And I have them fill out a worksheet because it's a workshop, right? It's not a seminar. So and I didn't used to do that. So I thought a worksheet and I have that worksheet right here. And I said, this, you said this was important to you when we talked about it at the workshop, when I told you that story. And they're like, yeah, you're right. And so it's like, okay, so you need, you know, you need that, right? So now let's talk about how you distribute your assets. Now, are you a second marriage? Do you have kids with like the Brady Bunch? You know, do you have a son-in-law that you're a little concerned about? Do you have a child who has special needs? Do you, I mean, any of those things that we've all, we've organized things so we can relate it back to the workshop. And then they're like, oh, yeah, oh, I remember that. You know, it's, oh, Biff, yeah, it's old Bambi. You know, so they they know, or the Bradys, you know, so so they can relate back to those things. And so we, we try to structure our vision meeting, the console, so that it ties back to those stories. I love that you have the worksheet. So that way you have something that will anchor them during the workshop and you're able to anchor them to those stories. And then kind of, I guess, you know, one of the things that that we've done kind of intentionally, we, we've gone through different kind of how we branded the workshop and named it and packaged it. So the one we use now is called the estate plan you didn't know you had. Because what most people don't know, so I usually start the workshop off like this, is I'll say, okay, how many people in the room have done estate planning? All right. And usually a third. Right. And then I'll say, how many of you think you have an estate plan? And oddly, less than a third will raise their hand to them. Okay. They said, now everybody raise your hand. And they all raise their hand. I'm like, that's how many people have an estate plan. Because if you don't do one, the state of Michigan has one for you. So if you want the state to make all your decisions for you, you can leave right now. That's such a good way. I bet everyone leaves in their seat. They're like, what? You know, that's kind of the the the, the initial hook we use. And then we explain to them, this is, how they, this is how the state's plan works. So if it's good for you, you can get up and leave now too. But if not, so we use this kind of our thing is the big site. Are, are you all set? And it's like, if you're not all set, then you need to come see us. I love that. Okay. So you have the worksheet, you have the stories, you have that $250 discount off of the con to get them in the door. Mm -hmm. Something that I'm curious about, because I know you touched on it earlier about the importance of 
all of those touches, like the follow-up and being personal about it. Obviously, that's something that has helped you be successful. I'd love to hear more about that. What what tricks you have that have worked the best for you? Um, so the idea was before COVID, what we would do is, is that you would, when somebody RSVP, you'd call them and talk to them, right? Kind of give them an idea of what was going to happen. Not a long call, but five minutes, you know. Sure. I'm sure they understood where to go, when to come, you know, what was going to happen when they got there. Um, very broadly, and then we would call them in the kind of the two to two to three day window again and contact them to remind them that they're coming. We do think so when they when they walked in, they would have a folder with their name on it when they came. So, but those two calls would you know, that I would say we had that probably creates a twenty percent difference on the RSVP to show up. The two phone calls. As the two to, phone calls, and they have to be phone calls. Yeah, three emails, it just doesn't work as well. It just doesn't. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the magic there, but it's there. But I make a point of it when they come in the room to at least to have a personal touch with them there. Like, hey, where are you from? What brought you? And then I do the workshop, and then I usually hang around for a half an hour after. But you can always use, you know, one of the levers that I always use is that I don't let people ask questions much during the workshop. And see, I'm trying to respect everybody's time. We're going to deliver the material to you. What you need to understand is that many of the questions that you want to ask are personal in nature and like they should be confidential. And I can really only address them if you're at a vision meeting. So I, you know, when you ask the question, if it's very general, I'll answer it for everybody in the room. But the other ones, I'm going to tell you to go out and sign up for your vision meeting. You know, by the way, did you come on? And it's for you. And, you know, I'm not going to pressure you to buy anything from me when we're all done. If you want to move forward, you can. And that's important. And then the next, you know, kind of that next step is that once you get them to sign up. So we we have them, we have a sign up sheet. They're always prepared with blocks of time. They can come and just sign up for their vision meeting. So we want to have that there. We try to get as many of those as we possibly can at the meeting. And then you need to follow up with them personally again with a phone, phone call. Phone call. That doesn't work as well. We lose. It's like this twenty percent recidivism, you know, fall off rate. If, if, if it just if, it just happens like that, they know you care. I think more than anything. I don't know how else. You know, it's like, oh, they care enough to call me. I'm going to care enough to show up, right? You know, the things that I think are really important from from our respect. Does it take time? Yeah, I have colleagues that are the, they're solo practitioners with no help, and they make all these calls themselves. Really. So, Good for them. I mean, it's, they do that. And they're they're more successful than I am because they're making the call. So, in any event, you know, those are so as as, as far as the overall business goes. So, workshop business probably represents sixty to seventy percent of our business. But we try to, you know, as much as possible, we try to run everybody through a workshop so they've got you know, that preliminary education, understand the perils and opportunities. All right. Did you have? Any final tricks or tips that you want to share with the audience when it comes to workshops? I'm, I'm so far impressed with Facebook marketing. So I will tell you, so personally, I'm not on Facebook. So from our business, we are. I've just never been. My wife told me, you don't have time for social media. <laughs> so I'm on LinkedIn and that's it. So, yeah. So, but our target audience is there and you can find them there. So I would say that is that, you know, that's Facebook marketing. And I mean, we've had success with Bambiz. Um, is a great way to connect with people, um, you know. And then, you know, the other thing that we have, I guess is one thing we haven't done yet, is we have a huge list of people that have RSVP'd through the system. It didn't show. So we're now going to go back and try to, my new client services person, is, you know, we're going to go back through this list of people that haven't shown and start making those personal touches with them to try to draw them in. Yeah, because those are hot leads. Yeah, they, they even signed up. You were interested enough to click yes, right? So yeah, yeah I want to I want to come. So so you know, so we feel like that's a huge untapped market. Um, but again, you know, I, I would just say that I'm impressed with our ability to connect with with an audience via Facebook. But you know, just again, try to tell relatable stories, relate to people, um, you know. And you have stories every day in your practice that you can tell. Across well, it almost it almost sounds like you could wrap it up into two big tips: connect with people on Facebook because that's where your audience is, and then yeah. connect with people through workshops through stories. 
Yes. And, and, and call them. Yeah. And call them. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know. Uh, yeah. I am guilty. I'm a, I am a millennial. We're big fans of text messaging, big fans. <laughs> yeah. But that's not, that's not the same story for the older generation. So I'm really glad that you mentioned calling is, I love how you worded it earlier about if they care enough to call, then I can care enough to show up. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, Jack, thank you so much for meeting me today. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. I'm glad to be here and, and glad, to, glad to have a chat. Thanks for listening to the Elder Law Growth Podcast, the place to be for all things marketing for elder law and estate planning law firms. If you liked this podcast, please leave us a review wherever you are listening to this podcast. If you'd like to outsource your marketing to our team, go to bambiz.net and book a free call with us today.